plants, for the things that we need, the resources to be concentrated in the places and organized in a way that can transform poverty generationally in our community. So please let us help you tell that story. And if I can say one thing for this year, let us say we are going to wrap around our community's most vulnerable citizens in order to break the cycle of poverty in the next generation. Society. Um, why is that important in the black community? That's important in the black community because of what they call mass incarceration. Uh, there have been so many black males that have been incarcerated uh, that is staggering, and we have normalized that. Um, but the reality of it is, <clears throat> is that it's not really mass incarceration. It's very targeted uh, incarceration. And what I mean by that is that the people who are being incarcerated are coming from very specific neighborhoods, and those are the neighborhoods where poverty is concentrated. And that concentrated poverty, there's crime. <clears throat> it talks about your life expectancy, the health, you know, how you get your transportation, where you work. All of those things are based on where you live. Um, <clears throat> and when, when we talk about West Louisville, we, we, see, a, we see this problem. But it's, it's not really a problem that came about because we made these choices. It's a problem that came about because of policies, public-private policies. So what I'm here to talk about today, just very briefly, are the solutions to, you know, the solutions as I see them to this poverty. And what, what is the other side of poverty? It's about black wealth. It's about building black wealth. And how do we, how do we go about that? Uh, what I believe one way to build black wealth is through what they call crowd investment. Crowd investments allows the people in the community to come together and invest their capital to, to, to provide business opportunities, to provide housing, uh, or whatever the community needs. Um, and when I look at that and I, and I think about what is it that we do, how do we do that, <clears throat> there are platforms um, that exist, and these platforms allow people to pool their money together to provide capital to entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, uh, to people who need uh, and, and desire capital to buy houses, uh, to create commercial corridors in the communities that we live in. Um, and the last thing that I want to say and touch on here <clears throat> is the philanthropic community. And as the philanthropic community, um, instead of necessarily providing grants and programs, what if they invested in our communities? What if they invested in businesses? What if they invested in home ownership? What if we changed from charity <clears throat> to justice and we started to concentrate on building black wealth and we didn't have to talk about poverty anymore? Thank you. chapter of Kentucky for the Commonwealth. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. We heard a lot of talk recently about unemployment figures, the stock market, what percent economic growth in the last quarter, and so on. The unemployment rate in Louisville is 3.5 percent. The black unemployment rate in Louisville is 7.7 percent. The stock market reaches record highs, then drops. Let's say that the economic growth rate for the last quarter is X percent. When the growth rate reaches X percent, do the people in the small towns and rural areas stop doing heroin and Oxycontin? Do crack sales in the urban areas go down? Uh, no, they don't. Because obviously the benefits of the economy we have now only go to a small number of elites. 52% of Americans own stock, most indirectly. Only 18.7% own stock directly. Are ordinary people buying stock by choice are because they have been denied defined benefit pensions? Are they forced to invest in mutual funds in the stock market, trying to put together some kind of retirement since ordinary people can't earn any significant interest on their savings account? 
There are still plenty of black people in Louisville locked out of the market for good jobs because they are perceived to not have the right skills or they have the right skills but are at a mature age where companies simply don't want to pay them what they are worth or they are screened out because their names are too Afrocentric or they have felonies on their record. People with jobs are afraid they are going to spend their entire lives working three bad jobs with no pension. People close to retirement are afraid to retire because they fear they won't have enough money to live on. Ordinary people, white, black, and brown, don't believe the economic indicators pertain to them because their lives are not improving. Elites in Louisville live in an alternate universe, separate from the lives of ordinary people. The public-private partnerships, and tax breaks presented to us by our elites only serve to drain money out of the public treasury. We have Metro Council people in Louisville talking about hiring more police when we can't even afford to pay the pensions of the police we have now. We, the city and the state, are doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing. We should be suspending or eliminating tax breaks so that we have enough revenue for investing in pensions, educating workers, and supporting public services. We are going in the wrong direction. But it's not too, turn, it's not too late to turn it around and get it right. It is never too late to do the right thing. Thank you. After moving to this community. I heard a piece on NPR in which it was noted that in cities with at least one million citizens, Louisville was ranked as the fourth most segregated in the country. I recall pausing to wonder, what are the symptoms of being the fourth most segregated city? How does this manifest? Later in the same year, I sat among and intently focused, being in fellows class, puzzling over measures to improve the health of people living in low-income neighborhoods, primarily brown zip codes, where life expectancy is more than 10 years less than people who live in affluent neighborhoods, primarily white zip codes. The data resoundingly suggests that with higher earnings comes longer lifespans, better health, home ownership, better schools, and lower crime rates. Creating better employment and earning opportunities is indeed the most magical of bullets. In this day and age, it is hard to find an employer who does not espouse to provide equal opportunity. Employment data in human resource departments across the city tell an uncomfortable story. Certain jobs are filled with certain people. Equal employment opportunity must extend beyond hiring to include career advancement opportunities, training, active mentoring, equity and reclassifications and promotions, bias-free performance assessments, assumption of leadership roles, and work in positions that are mission critical, positions that are not vulnerable for reduction in force in times of budget crisis. At the University of Louisville, an analysis of our affirmative action data tells us that we have a concentration of employment of people in service and maintenance positions the lowest wage earning positions on our campus. This is nearly twice what the local market analysis and population data might suggest. Yet, in the job category immediately above skill crafts, we see some of the lowest employment percentages for minorities on our campus. We are but one employer in this community. Creating career pathways to include partnerships with apprenticeship and journeyman programs will impact lifetime earnings and career opportunities. Better employment and better earning opportunities are indeed the most magical of bullets.
discussing wealth gaps by race in this community, if I hear one more time from white folks how black folks need to stop spending money on rims, Tim's, sneakers, as though that is the extent of our interest, I believe I'm just going to scream and lose my mind. Our savings percentage gaps, as compared to whites and other minorities, is not the singular source of this 83% wealth gap. It is not. In fact, contrary to arrogant, dismissive, ill-informed opinion, opinion, some believe that uh, black people, it's our behavior, it's our spending habits, it's our educational attainment choices, perhaps even our age, that have rendered us below the standard in wealth attainment. But hear me when I say those factors pale in comparison to the most compelling and destructive cause of wealth gaps in this country, and that is racism. The cancer giving rise to income inequality, racism. The cancer giving rise to unfairness in our justice system, employee disengagement, broken homes, depression, anxiety, unfair work practices, death by ill motive officers, silly and loosely defined corporate diversity policies, inequitable discipline in schools, and just about any other collective experience of the African American, the black person in this country, it is attributable to racism. Wealth is defined as what you own minus what you owe. So median black wealth levels are about 90% lower than median white, yet median income levels are about 40% lower. Most black families have some wealth, but one in five black families have zero, or even worse yet, negative wealth. As a matter of prescription, wage growth is important. When we think about wealth attainment, it's easy to formulate how to do it, right? The steps that you go about to do this, seemingly foolproof. Number one, work and accumulate cash. Now, our peak earning years as Americans is between 30, uh, ages 30 and, and 60. So what are we doing as black folks most of the time during that time? Trying not to die. <laughs> Trying not to die from catastrophic, catastrophic illnesses like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and these are so expensive to treat. But we catch these, much like we catch police bullets, at a much higher rate than whites. So the next thing they tell us is to save money. Well, what about pay inequity? What about underemployment? What about the fact that I don't have any cash? Why don't you just borrow it? From who? Parents? Neighbors? Family? We very rarely have access to fair credit, and we try like heck to avoid predatory lenders. Why? Because a bank credit card is only 12 to 30% annual percentage rate, but a payday loan for a loan under $500 could be upwards of 400% interest rate. Mm. By the way, with many traditional banks based on credit quality standards, liquidity and other factors, on average, blacks are twice as likely to have credit requests denied than whites are. So the single most determinant in slipping into poverty is the fact that you don't have any cash. Just not having cash will render you poverty stricken. Why? Because you can't cover emergencies. And emergencies always happen, and they will wipe out what wealth you have if you're not careful. And even in the US, though all groups suffer from financial insecurity, blacks have it worse. So then the next thing they say is buy a home. But not just any home, buy a home in a white neighborhood. Because why? That will appreciate. Home in a black neighborhood won't. If it does appreciate, it's gonna be less than 60% of what you would have had appreciation in a white neighborhood. But then you should buy stocks. Well, where do you buy stocks? Can you ask your parents? Can you ask your neighbors? Where do you get advisement to, to buy stocks? How do we get access to those kind of folks that make influence over our financial decisions? And then lastly, they tell us, inherit money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> inherit money from your parents. Um, on average, the white inheritance is $144,000 a year. The average black inheritance is about 41000 so there's a lot of policy issues that we have to look at in order to get this straight, and I think you'll see all of those in uh, the, the paper that I wrote. 
But I would want to end by saying there are some things that we can control, some, some real things that we can control that we really need to look at. The Center for Health Equity um, here in, in Louisville operates under the auspices of the city. Help me to think about today the extent to which we could influence our growing, okay, I'm not done, I'm just trying to, growing old, inheritance, um, buy, borrow money from people who are not going to charge you out the wazoo. Um, let's, let, when we think about wealth building, wealth attainment with black folks is less about the choices we make and more about the choices we have. I'm going to make this morning. Thank you. I'm Tim Finley, pastor of Kingdom Fellowship Christian Life Center, CEO of Life Development Corporation, and I wholeheartedly believe in the prophetic, because as I look to my left, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis is going to be fully funding our church. Thank you so much. I didn't know. I didn't know. Thank you. I'm blessed. Y'all have a good day. I'm here to talk about youth development. Uh, there is a fundamental question that I believe that demands an answer on today. It is a fundamental question that each and every one of us must ask ourselves, and that is, do our youth matter? Do our youth matter? Uh, you will hear all the statistics today, uh, whether it's the academic gap, whether it is health equity, whether it is redlining here in our city. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and all of us must understand this, is that our youth need us. They don't need our post on Facebook, they don't need our wonderful words, but they need us to make an investment in their lives. I am a product, I only got five minutes, y'all hold that to the end. I am a product, I am a product of right parenting, I am a product of investment from a community. I am one that went to nine schools in 12 years. I could have easily went another way, but I had a wonderful group of people around me that made a positive investment in our lives. We can sit today and blame many things, but if the truth be told, we have to go into the areas where our youth are, and we've got to volunteer, we've got to show them things that they're not seeing on television, we've got to make sure that we're in a position to help our youth. If we do not do this, if we do not do this, this will, again, negatively affect our economy, our communities will not grow, our people will see this outcome, this, this effect, this, uh, this degradation will continue to spread in our communities. I'm asking you today to look at our youth and ask yourself, do they really matter? And if they matter, stop making excuses, find a youth, and let's wrap our arms around them and give them the best opportunity to succeed that we can. God bless you. Hello, I'm Bruce Williams. My topic is um, the White Evangelical Church turning a blind eye to racial injustices. I believe that one of the reasons why racism and white supremacy persists in American society is because America has sought to support and justify it by reaching out to various corners of American life. America has thought it necessary to do that, uh, not only to maintain white supremacy and white uh, privilege, but also because you cannot treat a group of people with such damnable inhumanity without threatening your own sense of humanity as well. So you have to find some justification for your behavior. And so. They've turned to various disciplines like psychology, sociology, biology, and the like to try to support and justify white supremacy. Unfortunately, one of the institutions that have been complicit with this is the White Evangelical Church. The White Evangelical Church has historically been guilty of providing the theological underpinnings for the perpetuation, promotion, and sustaining of white supremacy and white racism in our community. Racist teachings like uh, the Curse of Ham and other related teachings were designed to help shore up historically and buttress and promote uh, things like slavery and segregation and other expressions of white supremacy. And I suppose it's because their parishioners are the beneficiaries of a system that favors whites 
over others. And as a consequence, on the whole, uh, white evangelicals have not been a part of the struggle for racial justice. They have not been a part either at the forefront or in the file, rank and file of being a part of uh, dealing with racial injustice in our community. Now, uh, as a consequence, um, they speak a lot about equality, may even quote some of the political documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But when it comes time to making those a reality in the context of white supremacy, what you usually see is you either hear silence, excuses, or outright resistance mm -hmm. to the fact that we need to address this issue of racial uh, inequality. Um, I suppose that part of the reason is that they are more concerned about order than justice. Mm -hmm. That's why um, law and order rhetoric is so prevalent among them and so attractive to them because I suppose they think that because it's legal it's right, but we know better than that. Just because something is legal does not make it right. Slavery was legal, segregation is legal, apartheid was legal whole host of things or other are, are legal. Uh, in fact, Dr. King calls that an unjust law and says an unjust law is no law at all. So if the white evangelical church is going to be true to its founder, then it must no longer turn a blind eye to racial injustice. It must be involved in paying the cost for bringing about racial injustice, not simply racial reconciliation, which is what they talk a lot about which usually has to do with personal relationships and personal privileges. That is not the same as dealing with racial uh, justice. The two are inextricably bound together. You cannot have racial reconciliation as a, as a goal and not be tied to the struggle for racial justice. And so if the white evangelical church in the country and in our community is going to be involved in the struggle for racial justice, and do it with integrity. There are at least four things that have to happen. First, they must confess their complicity to white supremacy and racism. Secondly, they must uh, repent, which means to change your mind and not simply have write letters of apology for the past. Third, they must engage in helping to repair uh, the damages that have been done historically and even personally by white supremacy. And to repair something means we got to talk about red horations. And finally, it means you must be involved in the struggle to dismantle uh, uh, white supremacy. If they would do that, then I believe that they would be in line with not only helping to bring in what Jesus called the kingdom of God and King called the beloved community, but they would also be in line with the bronze savior and sandals wearing carbon to get from Galilee. God Amen. bless you. To look at the media, TV, print, social, you would not see this positive narrative reflected. That is a problem. One that perpetuates a stereotype and a negative image that is hard to overcome, and that unfortunately has allowed bad policies and unjust systems to persist. Combined, these impressions, policies, and systems have created barriers to success, and in some cases, to life itself. And those barriers and those short lifespans disproportionately affect communities of color. And at Metro United Way, we are determined to change that. We must be if we are going to live true to our purpose of providing every person with the belief, with the means, and with the opportunity to reach their full potential. We must follow the data, and we must be willing to disproportionately invest to create equity where it is lacking. We work every day with our partners to move individuals and families from need to independence. And we know that to be successful, we must work together to address the interconnected challenges that are holding individuals in our community back. We know that childhood development, that youth success, that food security, stable and affordable housing, good paying jobs, financial products and empowerment workshops that move people towards financial independence, and safe places to live, work, and play are critical to the health of not only individuals but to our communities as a whole. 
And we're excited about the black male achievement work that we highlighted in our essay in the State of Black Global Report. In that work, we are focused on improving the life outcomes of young men and boys of color in our community. And we are grateful to our partners, both locally and nationally, including the Association of Black Foundation Executives and BME Community for helping guide us in this work and helping guide our community in this work. With these national and other community partners and informed by the voices of local men and boys that are in our community today, we are committed to four areas. One, developing a deeper focus on responsive grant making with an intentional equity lens to reduce the racial disparities that we see in our community. We are committed to leading with data disaggregated by race and by gender, to design policies and programs and great making strategies that make it easier to wrap around individuals and families. Those holistic wraparound services that we know are going to lift up and address all of those boxes that Ben, who just happens to have the same last name as me, talked about earlier. <laughs> We need to pull them all off of the backs of our folks in our community. We are committed to messages, to, or excuse me, to messaging issues facing people in communities responsibly, focused on an asset frame. We know there are challenges, but let's talk about the good things that individuals of color and immigrants and others bring to our communities every single day. We are also committed to developing culturally responsive, innovative solutions that start with the voice of those that we are seeking to empower. As a community, we can and we must overcome the inequality present between people, races, and zip codes. And we invite every single one in our community to join us and our partners. Please check us out at MetroUnitedWay.org. And as we are here today, also please take a moment um, to hold in your hearts my colleague and co-author on this essay, Daryl Unseld Jr., who is laying his father, Daryl Unseld Sr., to rest this evening and this weekend. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Berry. I work with 55,000 Degrees. At 55K, our goal is to see, by the year 2020, 50% of Louisville's adult population with a degree. I want to show you a slide that shows you our progress toward that goal since the year 2008. There's a lot of numbers on here, so let me, let me just make sure we're all on the same page. The middle line shows the, the percentage of all working age adults in Jefferson County who have an associate degree or higher, about 42%. The top line shows the percentage of white adults in Jefferson County with a degree, 47%. And the red line at the bottom shows the percentage of black adults in our community with a degree, 24%. Now I have to tell you that I absolutely cannot stand the lines on this chart. I can't for a lot of reasons. I can't stand what it says about our past and, and who we are today. But mostly I can't stand that it allows people to talk about achievement gaps. Because that's not what this shows. What this shows is the result of an opportunity gap. Let me give you an example. In Kentucky, in 1904, the day law was passed. That made it illegal for black students to attend the same colleges and universities as white students until the year 1950. So why would we be surprised that a couple of generations later, our degree attainment looks like this? We shouldn't be. It was on purpose. And why would we be surprised that black families still struggle disproportionately in our community with poverty? 45% of black kids in Louisville struggle with poverty versus 14% of white kids. And we all know that if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, it makes it really, really hard to thrive academically. So what ends up happening is too many black kids internalize the idea that school is not a place for them. And if school is not a place for them, then college certainly isn't either. You add to that tuition prices at the college level that are going so high so fast, and we put ourselves in a scenario where it's very likely that we're going to continue to see this or that it might get worse. So that's why at 55K, we are taking part in a new partnership in the community called the Louisville Promise. At the core of the promise, is the goal to build a scholarship program that ensures that every JCPS graduate can afford at least two years of community or technical college. But as I just touched on, the challenge is way bigger than just money alone. And so it's also a commitment amongst all the partners involved in the promise to work together in a new, smarter way so that every single kid in our community has the kind of support and opportunity that they need. That's the challenge before us in this community, is to provide the opportunity 
The Louisville Promise at its core is an opportunity for all of us to end the discussion about attainment gaps and to end the existence of opportunity gaps. I believe firmly that through this work, our community can come together and in our lifetimes, these lines finally will too. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is uh, James Cayetos White, and I'm the head of school at Louisville Collegiate School. Um, when I turned 18 years old, I left the state of Kentucky, born and raised in Hopkinsville, with the intent of potentially never coming back. But here I am, I'm back. And I'm back actually today with a challenge, with a challenge to you. I'm an educator. I have been from the moment I went to college to the moment that I stepped out, I've been an educator. I believe in the value. I believe in the hope that education brings. But more importantly, I am a product of what a great education can do. But let me tell you something that I've learned since being back here in Louisville about this community, about what I see as an outsider. Because you know, if you haven't been in Louisville for 20 years, you are an outsider here. <laughs> but as an outsider, one of the things that I've been able to see and understand here is that Louisville is a city right now that loves being just in front of the curve. Just in front, not too far out in front where you might take some risk to get some reward, but just far enough to say, we're not doing nothing. We're not doing nothing. And see, that for an educator is a problem. Because if you're a student in my class and you are just doing enough, that is not enough. And so my challenge is about ownership of what it means to do enough. I am the first African-American head of school. And I say first because there should be more after me. I should not be the last. But let's be clear here that every step we take, there are obstacles, there are challenges that we must face head on. We cannot pretend that, th that they don't exist. We cannot pretend that if we keep the status quo and we move one inch at a time, that we will get to where we want. We want 50,000 degrees. What are we going to do to get 50,000 degrees? We want accountability at the government level. What is our responsibility to own that process? Because, see, I had a mentor that talked to me about the difference between owning something and just being a part of it. Because when I walk in your house, and I don't own that house, I'm a guest. I ask you, where is your bathroom? May I use it? What's in your refrigerator? Can I get a drink of water? But when I own it, I walk in that house or that school or this city and I say, it's mine. I deserve everything that is in here. I have access, unlimited access to everything that is here. And at the end of the day, I'm proud because it is mine. If we want to see change in the city of Louisville, then what are we going to do to own our part? This is not about owning every part, because for me, my little part sits in uh, Cherokee Triangle right now. But let me tell you, we have more African-American students in that school right now than we ever have in the history of that school. We have... We give out more financial aid in terms of getting kids to our school than any other school in this city. So when I tell you that I'm doing my part and I'm trying to own my part, my challenge to you is what can you own about this problem? Because let me explain to you that without ownership, we will pass the buck until it's too late. And that's what we are good at, staying just far enough out in front to say we're doing something when we're really not doing anything. So as I leave you today, my challenge is find out what space you are in, find out how you own that space, and then find out that with that ownership, what can you do to make Louisville the city that we all want it to be? Thank you.
Yes! Moga, brothers and sisters. I'm honored to follow my dear brother, Dr. James Cagliaros White. I just learned how to pronounce that this morning. And here's a plug in my five minutes. Catch the Ricky Jones Show with 12, Mr. FTC. We are interviewing Dr. James Cagliaros White Sunday morning at 10. He has a magnificent story. He had time to tell you. This man was born to a mother, 15 years old, did not know his father, was in a house that had an outhouse and ended up being a Harvard grad and then came home to Louisville to do the fabulous work he's doing. He's the main reason my daughter is at Louisville Collegiate now, because I ain't got the money to send her, so they, they, they give us all of that. Also, I'm happy to follow my dear brother Mark Murphy. Be on the lookout for our new book coming out at some point called Colin, Confederates, and Con Artists, Essays on American Politics, Passions, and Possibilities. So we're trying to do our little piece. So I'm going to go quick so they don't do the Apollo thing on me and pull the cane out on me. My brief talk is about higher ed, and it's great because we have so many people here that could talk for 30, 45 minutes on their own. My grandmother, and like Brother James, I was, my, my mother was 15 when I was born, raised by my grandmother, who was born in 1933 in rural Georgia, never had the chance to go to school, died in 2009, barely literate. And she told me, I don't know what you can do with an education, but I know what you can't do without one. That's a huge thing. We are still in a place where a lot of people in Kentucky do not know what you can do with an education. Unfortunately, across lines of race, Kentucky ranks number 45 in the country, 45th in the country. For those of you who do not know, there are only 50 states. <laughs> it ranks 45th in the country in percentage of people 25 years or older who have high school diplomas. It ranks 47th in the country for people 25 years or older who do not have a bachelor's degree. 47th in the country is Kentucky, only ranking behind Mississippi, Arkansas, and West Virginia. It is not great company to be in. Meanwhile, the leadership of the state is once again cutting funding to higher education by four and a half percent this cycle and targeting cutting it even more during the next budgetary cycle. So that tells you that the state of Kentucky is not actually serious about higher education. Maybe not very serious about education at all. But we have a terrible bifurcation that is taking place here. If that's what's going on in Kentucky overall, you can only imagine how African Americans in the Commonwealth are impacted. We are still at a time when W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talent of the 10th at the turn of the 20th century. He was talking about the 10% of African Americans who had college degrees. We still have not doubled that. Only about 21% of black women get college degrees. Only about 17 to 18% of black men do. It is worse here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I'm saying we have to take that on. And we also have to have very serious conversations about the type of education our children are getting. I certainly respect the, the move for trade schools, uh, 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 junior colleges, technical schools, all of that. But while many elites are talking about our children going to trade schools and technical schools, their children are going to Ivy League schools. That is something we must engage. So if we are going to be serious about moving forward, because no great city is great without a thriving university. So if the University of Louisville is damaged, then the city of Louisville is damaged and the state of Kentucky is damaged. So like the brother said, let's make Morga great. Let's make UofL great again and Kentucky great for the first time. We can do it together. <laughs>
lighter yellow pieces, I'm just going to go on to our next map, which shows the demographics of where people are living in Louisville. Do we see some similarities, some patterns there? I'll go back and forth a couple times. Mm -hmm. I want to, at this time, just take a quick moment of silence because I think it's really important that we recognize data is numbers, but there are people behind this data, right? There are people that we need to honor right now who have lost their lives before they were ready. So let's just take a moment and honor the mamas and the daddies and the children, the brothers, the sisters, the aunts. Just take a moment. Okay, so going back to this life expectancy map, and this is an average. So we're talking about a 12.6 year life difference depending on where you live and who you are, but that's an average. If we're breaking down that data by who you are, right, so your race and your gender, we see even starker differences. For black men in Louisville, we see between a 2.5 and a 16.75 life difference, depending on who you're comparing them to. For black women, we see a 2 to 12.72 life difference. So this is important, and I want to talk really quickly about why. When we talk about life expectancy, diabetes, cancer, any of those things, we're talking about health outcomes. For us, that's, what's, that's the leaves of the tree. That's an outcome. That's not, the, that's not the beginning of the problem. So we want to zero in on what we call the roots of our tree, okay? So those are root causes. So things that you've heard people talking about today, things that the Urban League attacks and intervenes in so beautifully, those are things like transportation and access to housing. Our food access. What's our experience with a criminal justice system looking like, right? So those, our experiences with those root causes, that shapes our health outcomes, but even more so because of the history and the context of this country. Our experience with root causes are shaped by systems of power. For us, in our metaphor here, that's the soil. So our trees are planted in racism in this country. They're planted in sexism, homophobia, ableism, right? We can go down the list of all of the ways that we know those systems of power shape those root causes for us. They pattern those root causes. And I just want to say here really quickly that we all experience these root causes. We all experience housing. We all experience food to some degree, but how we experience that in our communities is shaped by systems of power. So I just want to just take a second and let everyone know that we have all of the resources right now in this community to make the changes that we want to see. We can live in an equitable world. And we don't even know what that equitable world looks like for us yet because we haven't done it. There's so many opportunities, there's so many new fields that would be created because in order for us to have an equitable world, we all have to do it. We all have to get in where we fit in, which is something I said this morning. And it requires all of us. So before I go, I just want to read some words from Dr. Kelly Pryor from her article just to name her here in this space. We cannot have a flourishing Louisville without a thriving black Louisville. A Louisville where black women and girls are fully cared for and accepted in their own right, not simply in relation to their male or white counterparts. Where the health of black men and boys are promoted through a lens of wellness instead of a constant state of crisis. In a city where our LGBTQ population across race and class are recognized as full and equal participants in society. I just wanna say again, we can do this. We have the resources to do it right now. Let's do it.